Hello, and welcome to Women Speak, a production of the Women's Resource Center in Wayne. I'm your host, Mojda Keika, and in each episode, I focus on a topic that is of interest to women and the people they care for. This interview is being conducted via Zoom on MLTV Mainline Network. Today, Women Speak is honored to interview Marsha Zaruba O'Connor, CEO and founder of The O'Connor Group. The O'Connor Group is a leading provider of talent acquisition and human resources consulting for the life science, healthcare, professional service, information technology, and manufacturing sectors. Based in King of Prussia, PA, with offices in Raleigh, North Carolina, and Tampa, Florida, the O'Connor Group has over 80 employees around the country. Recently celebrating their 15th year anniversary, the O'Connor Group is a top 100 woman-owned business and certified by the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. In 2022 alone, the O'Connor Group was fortunate to be the recipient of the Inc. 5000 Fastest Growing Businesses, the Philadelphia Business Journal's Best Places to Work and Most Admired CEO Awards, the Inquirer's Soaring 76, Philadelphia Titan 100, and the Entrepreneurs Forum Philly 100 Awards. Currently, Marsha is the president for the entrepreneur organization, Philadelphia Chapter. Prior to founding the O'Connor Group, Marsha held various senior level positions at Arthur Anderson and Anderson Consulting. Marsha loves helping entrepreneurs like herself and is currently rolling out a new nonprofit initiative specifically geared to startup female entrepreneurs called shadowher.org. Marsha earned her MS degree in human organization development from Villanova and her BS degree in accounting from Widener University. She is also a graduate of the Goldman Sachs's 10,000 Small Business Program. Marsha, I am delighted that you are joining Women Speak today and that we will be discussing your story as a female entrepreneur and your exciting initiatives. Welcome. Thank you, Moshe. So glad to have me. I'm so happy to be here today. It's so great to have you on the show. I wanted to start out by asking if you could elaborate on your own story and how you came to be an entrepreneur. Well, um, I guess it goes back to my days of being a child and mowing lawns. And I had a little lawn mowing business uh, back in Delaware County where I grew up. And uh, I had a neighbor that really took me under his wings and he showed me how to do more. And he's like, you know, you could do more. So I started plucking the, the weeds from the garden and he's like, you could do more. So I started learning how to do the hedges. And um, so when you start doing all the extras and you're perfectionist um, of how to do that kind of stuff, you get a lot of work. So the entrepreneur bug was always in my um, my DNA, I guess you could say. And then when I had a chance to open up my own, I've always wanted to do it. And I was working at a consulting firm doing well. And I kept telling my husband, I really want to go on my own. And he said, my God please, you know, either you either you do this or stop talking about it. And then I think it really hit home when my, my son was seven and um, he turned around and said, mom, can I see you more? And that really hit home. And I said, okay, everything is coming together. And I read the book, The Alchemist, highly recommended to anybody out there. And I came back from vacation and I told her I'm, I'm quitting. And I did not have a single client when I started. And, you know, how do you get started? You you get all your business cards together and you start having coffee chats and saying what you're going to do. And you have to be very specific about what you will be providing. And then one of them sticks. And I don't I always tell people don't do more than three uh, because you'll basically dilute what you're trying to do. And it started from there. I didn't hire my first full time employee until three years later. Right. So it was really a process, an incremental process, but you were building upon what you did before all the time. So that, like you said, from the time you were a child, you were incrementally building upon that desire to do things for yourself as an entrepreneur. 
Yes. And I had the accounting background. I was a commercial auditor with Anderson and I was always fascinated about how companies worked, how the widgets get to basically the final product and, you know, how to make money and what happens on it. And the biggest thing that most of my really strong mentors always told me that said, you have to make sure that you check the numbers, always be on top of the numbers. And it's a shame. I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and when they'll tell me that, well, I get my, my numbers and my accountant gives them to me. I just shake my head and I said, you have to change that because what happens is like they are your responsibility in the long run. And a lot of companies fail because they do not take care of their numbers. Yeah, which um, kind of leads me to my next question. You know, there are a lot of challenges in being an entrepreneur. And what kinds of challenges did you face as a female entrepreneur and how did you overcome them? Well, as we both know, because um, you're a, a fluent business leader out there as well, um, it, it's it's just part of the game. You know, unfortunately, we are still having a difficult time getting at the table. I still think it's, uh, you know, it's 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 difficult, but you have to believe in yourself. You have to have confidence. You have to have, I call them my Goombas around me to basically say, we got this together and you have to push. You know, there are many times I go into a session and I could tell immediately talking to the CEO, they look at, oh, is this happy little blonde coming in? And, you know, she, you know, she's so nice. And, and I'm like, you're not taking me seriously. And so I start talking about my accounting background, about what I can do, my operations, my technology background. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, I have their ear and it's, it's been this way for, since I started and it's okay, but I have a lot of clients that, um, to be honest with you, are men and have really embraced who we are, what we do. And actually they prefer sometimes a female um, on the professional services side because they're like, we know you're busy, you're gonna get it done. And you're a mom, you're gonna find a way. And I think that says a lot, but we still have a struggle out there. It's not gonna be easy. Yeah, I still think it, uh, I think COVID put us back a little bit to be honest with you, um, because a lot of moms had to leave the workforce to care, take care of their kids. And it's really hard to get back in the workforce sometimes. And people don't realize that. Like I know, um, I have one child and I have friends of mine who have four children and God bless them. That's a lot to manage. It's a lot to juggle and you have to be okay with it, which is why my work has very um, leniency for being a mom or a dad. Like if your your kid is sick, why are you talking to me? Take care of your kid, you know, because I don't ever want to be a place where you feel guilty taking care of your children. That's ridiculous. But there are places that make people feel guilty. And I just find that to be just ridiculous, but you can't take advantage of it either. There are some that do. Um, it's got to be a fine line there. But I think for women overall, we have to keep on pushing ourselves out there and keep doing what we're doing. But it's still a struggle. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm hearing about the approach that you have towards clients and how you approach new new prospective clients and the support that you say is important among entrepreneurs and female entrepreneurs. And I was wondering, what is the value you place on networking and why? Oh my goodness. I see. Well, I always tell people, listen, network is huge. Your network is going to get you in the doors. Your network's going to get you moving. And you know, college kids are always being told network, network, network. And I say, well, let me add number two to that. It's networking. It's also follow-up. A lot of people will network and network and get all these cards. I give out probably, I go to a networking event and I'll give out like 20 cards and maybe one person follows up with me. One. And I'm like, wow, what a mistake. I said, it's that 1% that's going to make it in this world and do really well. And it doesn't take a lot. It's basically that grit and that determination of what you want. And even I tell people like, listen, if you're spending time doing a Zoom and you're looking at 20 people on Zoom and their name is right there, why aren't you having a side little, you know, on your computer and basically going on LinkedIn and connecting with people right there, right then and just say, hey, nice to see you on Zoom today. It's like 20 connections like that. And you never know when you're going to need that connection. So to me, my connections have helped me in so many different ways. And even my first my first client was from a connection of someplace that I had worked at previously. Um, but it's really important to do that. But the connections you have, you have to stay on top of them. What I used to do when I first started, LinkedIn obviously was my key. I started LinkedIn with a, uh, I was on it in 2003. And at the holiday season, like to keep track of everybody that I knew, I found out that you could download um, a CVS from uh, a report from Excel, actually, and get everybody's name and, and email. And so what I did was a holiday greeting mail merge. And so it saved me from buying business cards, saved me from buying stamps. And I put a really nice little picture of some, you know, Christmas bowl with a little tree and says, thanks for being a, a part of us and, and happy holidays. 
from that alone, I got 10 new clients that spring. People saying, hey, thanks for reaching out. I really appreciate it. And it was all my connections. Now, I don't know if LinkedIn does that anymore. And I have a lot more connections now on LinkedIn. I think back then it was like 3,000. I think I have almost 12,000 now. So you have to be very careful about that. But it worked. And guess what? I mean, you're an entrepreneur starting off. Everything, you have to be careful. You have to take the you have to make a dollar stretch. You know, you don't have to have a beautiful office. You don't have to have beautiful, um, you know, marketing materials. Not yet. You know, you want to do it basically on a penny pincher, I always say, but be creative, be outside the box. And that LinkedIn was very helpful for me because it got to everybody. It was a blind copy. So it would be like, hello, Joe, you know, and happy holidays. So they thought I was only sending it to them and they didn't know I was sending it out to about 2,900 people besides them. Um, but those are the things you have to think about. But this is why it's so important to hang out with other women entrepreneurs um, if you're starting out, because we all share ideas and secrets. And that's another reason why I started Shadow Her. So, And I know that you are involved in the entrepreneurs organization. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that in terms of how do you set up networking opportunities for yourself and others? Oh, great thing. So EO, we call it as Entrepreneurs Organization, is an international organization consisting of about 17,000 CEOs around the world. And for each city, it's a little bit different about uh, membership. But for Philadelphia, you have to have a million or more in revenue. OK, we have programs also for people underneath that called accelerators. So of that 250 to a million, you're basically assigned a coach. You're assigned an accountability group. It's an amazing program to basically graduate you into EO. EO Network has been amazing. I actually have what we call a women chat. And there's five of us who are also very successful women entrepreneurs. We talk every month. We do it via Zoom. Sometimes we're doing it when we're walking. But the idea is to talk about one thing that's bugging them and one thing that's working well and what kind of advice can we give each other. And they're very, very, very deep conversations. And I get a lot out of it because sometimes I just have to talk to somebody about something and you can't always talk to your spouse or your child or your teammates about it. So it really helps me out a lot. But EO also has forum and forum is one of the most powerful things that it provides. And you'll be given basically a team of about seven to eight individuals in a room that you meet every month that you talk about everything. I think it was just hard for my schedule because recruiting in HR and I'm literally all over the place and you have to be consistent and go to that every month. And, you know, they don't like it if you miss because, you know, it's time is valuable. And so I was with the team for four years, a bunch of great, amazing guys, um, and they're like brothers to me to this day. But I just said, guys, my schedule's getting wackier and I hate missing or having to call out at last minute. I feel like I'm failing all of you. So I'm going to basically drop from that. And that's what I started this uh, women chat. And it's been phenomenal, actually, but a lot of fun. You've given us a lot of guidelines as to being an entrepreneur. And I'm wondering if you have any specific kernels of advice for female entrepreneurs. Well, I say with female entrepreneurs, number one, get your tribe, get your people that you trust, that you believe in, that you can talk to. One of the things I started was a women's CEO breakfast that we host the last Friday of every month. And we typically have between like 15 to 20 people that show up for it. But the idea is I like to share with them things that somebody should have told us like five years ago. And, you know, it's like, oh, where you been, you know, and because everybody's trying to sell you something and you, and you're believing everybody. And for me, I'm always willing to give somebody a, even a second try, but I definitely have been burnt. And I, I want to say, well, you know what, trust me, all these like mistakes that I've gone through, I don't want you to go through that. And so I really try to help other women entrepreneurs not have to experience all that and give them that, that guidance and that, um, you know, just that visibility. But, you know, I think for entrepreneurs, now it's cool to be called an entrepreneur. I think when I started in 2007, it wasn't exactly cool. I would have literally my women friends would say, well, that, I remember I had, I had old ladies tell me, she's like, that's really sweet. That's awesome, sweetie. Like, um, when are you going to get a, a full-time job? And I sat there laughing like, well, this is, this is my full-time job. And she's just like, no, no, this is like an interim thing. I'm sure until you get something at a company, right? I said, Wow. Whereas now it's like the cool thing to have an entrepreneur, you know, and be that entrepreneur. But, you know, when I first started, it wasn't exactly cool. Um, so I really think it's come a long, long way. But people have to understand 
entrepreneurship is not for the weak at heart. It is a lot of hours. It is a lot of time. You know, you have to, if you really want to scale, you have to build people, take care of it. You have to hire the right people. You have to do a lot of communication. I literally think I spend 25% of my week basically with communication and motivating my troops and taking care of my clients and and making sure everything's running smooth. I have got a great um, growth person. I've got a great operations person. You know, I have amazing teams. But I'm still basically um, working basically now on the business instead of in the business. That sounds like a great place to be. And I'm wondering about some professional challenges you might be facing and how, how do you solve them currently? Well, I think professional challenges, it, there's always something every day is, is a challenge. Um, I would think right now it's probably the economy. You know, it's, it's so wishy-washy people. It, it, there really is no consistency ever since COVID. I mean, COVID alone was a shock to the system, right? And um, and then we were very fortunate with COVID because COVID made HR cool and half of our team are HR consultants. So now everybody realized why they needed HR at the table and they didn't need somebody in person. So we went high flying and became a lot, we've, we've like tripled our HR team and during that time frame, and we grew significantly 2021 20, and 22. Now this year, everybody has pulled back. The rates have gone higher. Recruiting has slowed down. And we're definitely starting to see that uh, a little bit of burn there, but not too much because we have a lot of clients that we are the recruiting team and we did take good care of them and our model is different. You know, we obviously charge hourly versus a contingent or routine. And so people seem to really enjoy that. And, um, you know, it's it's an interesting time right now because it used to be more of the bigger companies you want to focus on. And now you want to focus on the small companies because recruiting is still hot and heavy. But for the bigger guys, I think they hired too many people, probably like 21 and 22. So they're all pulling back on their big, big orders. But the small guys still need people. And so we're still flourishing in that area. But I always tell people we could always use more. Um, but I think for now, we're still maintaining what we're doing. But I could see it getting a little bumpier. So people have to make sure that if you're an entrepreneur, you got to understand the trends that are happening. You got to watch the unemployment numbers. You got to watch all of that. And I always tell people like recruiting is like real estate. If real estate is hot and heavy, typically so is recruiting. And, you know, and if, if real estate pops down, then recruiting pops down. So it really ranges, which is why we have an HR team and a recruiting team. Because my HR team is extremely busy right now. And so it sort of complements each other. Um, and we do that on purpose. But it's been a it's been a journey. You know, every day is a journey. You just have to maintain where you're at and have reserves. Always have reserves as a company. So many people basically they um, they leverage themselves so much. And I'm 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 just that accountant that I'm too conservative and I won't do that. But I had friends that really hurt them during COVID um, because they couldn't pay for that that loan. So be very cautious about that. But there's so many great resources out there that I wish women knew ahead of time. Yeah, you were talking about uh, your teams and uh, your different your different operational teams uh, there at the O'Connor Group. And one criteria of a, of a really well-run and well-functioning company is people work well together. And I was wondering, what is your criteria for a well-functioning team? Great question. Um, we have four core values. You know, um, we actually call it CC, which is our purple squirrel that people take on vacation with them. It's pretty funny, but it, it helps them remember what our four core values are, right? You know, the collaboration, the curiosity, the execution, the integrity. So those are the four things that we look for in our people. And then one of the biggest ones is collaboration. A lot of times when you have consultants, they want to do it all their own. Like, I got this, I got this. And, and typically it's not about I have it or not. It's about how we can help each other. And and, you know, we're a team. So we have a talent team. We have an HR team and we have to respect each other to what they bring to the table. And I always try to use the analogy of either a ship or a car. And if you under, you know, up on the hood of a car, all the pieces in there have to work for the car to move. And it's the same thing as a company, all your pieces, everybody has a purpose here. Otherwise we wouldn't have, you know, what we have. And so everybody is important about what they bring to the table. And that's really important. And so I think we do a lot of that. We have a lot of fun. We laugh a lot. You know, we're a hybrid uh, work environment. And, um, you know, it's still difficult to have people in the office, even though we might have like 10 to 12 now, like, like usually Tuesdays and Wednesdays, which is nice. But, you know, it's still hard to have that kind of like mojo and keep them going and keep it moving because <clears throat> no offense, people call us when there's issues and problems, you know, so we're HR and recruiting, and usually there's an issue or a problem, they call us and, you know, we just have to be okay, put a smile on our face. It's like, no problem, we got you covered and get it moving. But as as the leader, like how I react 
is how they will act. And I tell my leaders that too. I said, if you are sweating, your team is taking a bath. Yeah, that's a remarkable level of self-awareness for any team leader to realize that they're 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 a role model for their team and and they they lead by example and by action. You know, some of your accolades uh, have spilled over into 2023, and I wanted to mention that uh, the O'Connor Group is a 2023 Best Workplace by the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I was wondering if you could tell me where is the O'Connor Group going in the future? That's a great question. Um, and we wouldn't have gotten that award without basically the whole team is basically giving a survey about what they like, what they don't like. I'm the only one that can't answer. Um, and I don't even see the results until the Inquirer uh, announces it. It was a surprise. We didn't even know we were on that list until my aunt called me and said, I see your name out there again. And I said, on what? And um, and she just said the Inquirer. I'm like, I guess we won. And um, so it was good to see that and share it with the team. I think overall, like where we're going, you know, we opened up Tampa, we opened up Raleigh, what we can do here in Philadelphia, we can do at those locations. And we really wanted to focus on cities that were significant growth, um, especially upon the entrepreneurs and the middle market. So when I say middle market, it's probably like revenues of 10 million or more. And um, we just seem to really help out with a lot of our clients. We're a true fractional HR and recruiting firm that we really try to help companies, not just like do a position, but we want to ask the question, like, why is it open? Do you need this right now? Is this the best time to hire this person? Hey, by the way, your website maybe needs to have a little bit of a change here. Oh, by the way, you know, your onboarding definitely has a little bit of needs a little bit of help because we're hearing this from some of the people that we place there. So we want to be more of a strategic partner with all of our clients. It's a very unique um, environment that we have, but we have a good reputation so far. We want to keep it, but we see that growth happening in, in companies and, and areas that are significantly growing. And right now, Nash, not Nashville, Nashville's next year. Um, um, Raleigh and Tampa are basically our two we're starting off with. So far, so good. That is amazing. And your company has a real desire to go the extra mile and provide wraparound services, which distinguishes uh, entrepreneurial companies one from another. And speaking about uh, entrepreneurial companies and female CEOs uh, in general, where do you see the cohort of Philadelphia-based female CEOs uh, going in the future? Well, I think we have an opportunity. You know, I'm also a member of the Forum for Executive Women, and they do that big survey every year as well as like people, women on boards. Um, so we definitely have come a long way. But I, you know what? I think it's an interesting time because we're still missing about 3 million people in the workforce. A lot of them have either retired or they just said, like, I'm I'm done. We have a lot of people who own their own companies that have said, I'm done. You know, I think COVID really wiped them out. And they just said, if an M&A or someone's going to come in and buy, I'm taking my opportunity. So a lot of that has been happening. I think for women alone, it's really just pushing out there and trying to be like, you know, the best they can be. And they want to be moms and they want work-life balance. And, you know, we're starting to see a shift back where people, they're not working as many hours. They they want to work less. They want to do all that. And there's a lot that are. Um, then there's like the overachievers, I guess, that I still probably have never done a 40-hour work week, but that's okay. Um and a lot of them want to do that. And you have to be okay with that uh, because the next workforce generation coming through is like that. Now it's changing. A lot of them aren't having kids now until their mid thirties, you know, or before it was young twenties and all. And so a lot of that's changing. A lot of them are getting married. A lot of them are just having, you know, pets instead of uh, the kids. And so all of that is changing and figuring out what they want. And they're changing their jobs more frequently as well. So before you can have a career and you can move up and do your thing, it's about two and a half years before somebody moves into another role because it's not so much, you know, they're bored or they just said, I think it's better that I, you know, move up, but I have to move out to move up. And a lot of women are taking the opportunity to do that. So I think it's good, but I also think that uh, we've all, we still have a long way to go, but we got to keep on pushing. Right. Though so you have to uh, lean in into the organization and into the greater community as well. I'm wondering, you, you you mentioned a little bit about COVID and your enormous growth over COVID. Was that around 40% growth in, in a space of a year and a half or something like that? Yeah, it was over 12 months, um, believe it or not. And we basically, like I said, um, HR became cool. 
And uh, it was so exciting to see that. But it was interesting because you sit back and you um, you say, wow, this is crazy. We had gotten like during COVID, everybody was just, you know, what do you do? How do you do it? I had a lo lot of long walks with my husband just saying, how can we help other people? So we came up with all these different ideas. We had a, um, a newsletter called the Survival Kit. We had Ask HR office hours, which were free for people to attend because they didn't know what they needed to do. And a lot of our clients couldn't afford us at that time. So we said, we're going to do all this to help you out. And so when then things got a little better, which is probably, I guess around August is when things just started to skyrocket. And we were so busy trying to keep up with everything and we did it. And I felt as if like, it's been, it's been a great ride. And um, I always tell people, I said, my team is either like half COVID and then my half after COVID people. Um, because it was a different kind of mentality because during COVID, we stuck together. We were extremely tight. We kept everybody close together. We had 15 minutes um, live uh, communications every single day and we made it fun and exciting and we stayed together as a team and a family. Um, where now I think we are as well, but it's different because we've also, you know, people sometimes go to our clients and that's okay, but it's just, it's hard because, um, you know, we have a great alumni group now, but I really do think that um, you got to stick together during that time frame. And COVID was a great experience for us, but, um, and we took advantage of it and said, let's, let's grow and do this. And we've got a great product and people like us. I'm hearing that you have a lot of uh, emphasis on developing relationships and building upon those relationships for the future, looking looking long term. And I think that's extraordinary for for uh, you know our quarterly analysis kind of culture. And I applaud I applaud the O'Connor Group for for looking at that kind of time frame. And I also wanted to express appreciation for your sharing your story with us today and your expertise. You also informed us about some exciting new initiatives you're creating in the region. I wanted to also reiterate about shadowherd.org. And uh, to our viewers, thank you for watching Women Speak. To learn more about the Women's Resource Center, please visit our website, womensresourcecenter.net. I look forward to bringing you more in-depth conversations in future episodes.